So that's what I'm going to, to talk about today. And, um, well, just one thing before we, we start. If you're not familiar with Unity, uh, don't worry, because this talk will not be too much about Unity and mostly about the technology that we're using and the reasons why we're using it. Uh, and so most of these principles are fairly generic. So the outline of my, uh, of my talk uh, is as follows. So I will start by just defining what we are doing and why we are doing it. So the kind of problems that we're dealing with and the kind of constraints that we have to work with. Then I'll move on to the, the principles of data-oriented design, um, which is the, the global approach that we, are, that we are taking to solve these problems. I will segue into ECS, and it's on ECS that I will spend most of my time. So ECS is the way that we apply these design principles to Unity. And finally, I will talk about the future of Unity, so what we are trying to do and what we are going to do uh, with ECS and the rest of the data-oriented tech stack. So, um, let's get started with the problem. So the problem that we are trying to address is scalability. And when we say scalability, we usually have in mind that sort of stuff. So this is a demo that we released last year at Unite, so the, the Unity conference. Uh, and this demo is called Megacity, and it was about having a large environment, so very big, um, a very big scene with a lot of things that the player can, can see and lots of uh, space where the player can fly his car. It's some sort of a futuristic city. And it's typically the kind of things which have been hard to do with Unity so far. So, as probably some of you know, when you make a game with Unity, it's really easy to get started. It's very um, accessible. Uh, but as you keep on adding more and more and more content, uh, you reach a point where you have to find clever ways of dealing with the complexity of your game. Um, and that's, that's a bit annoying. That's something that we want to address. We want to make it possible for you to keep on using the same base principles that you've been using for the whole development of your game up to the point where your game becomes really, really large. So that's usually what we have in mind when we say scalability. It's making much larger games than what you're, uh, than what you're um, used to do with Unity. But uh, scalability goes both ways. So this is scaling up, making larger games on the same hardware. But we also have in mind scaling down, which is about doing the same thing that you would be doing with um, the, the current versions of Unity, but then make it run on more constrained hardware, and make it run on lower-end phones or PCs. And this is also very interesting when you're, for example, running your game in server farms. So if you're hosting a massively multiplayer game, or if you're just uh, having a game that uh, streams instead of, uh, of being uh, run on players' devices and so on. That's also very interesting because this directly translates to the cost of operating your game. So, more precisely, when we say scaling, we have these two things in mind. For now, we mostly focus on the left side, so making something which is bigger with the same, same hardware. Uh, but we also have something that you might be familiar with, uh, which is called Project Tiny, uh, which is all about scaling down and having games run on a very, very small, well, with a very, very small footprint on small devices and so on. And now, the interesting part are the constraints that we have to work with. Um, I could have come up with a long list of constraints, uh, but I've only took two here. Uh, and the first one is a constraint that everyone has to work with. It's the hardware. So the hardware, PCs, phones, consoles, they all have the same issue right now, which is this. And you might have seen this graph because it's been used in a lot of, uh, a lot of presentations and it's uh, coming from this uh, book about computer architecture. So not the graph itself, but the, the values I use to plot that graph. 
uh, because this one is just based on these values. It's a bit uh, smoothed out and also extrapolated to the right. But what's important there is the trend. And so first, what is on that graph exactly? Well, um, if you look at the bottom left corner, you have a reference point, which is a typical computer of the early 80s. And if you look at the performance of memory and CPU from such a typical computer in the 80s, and then check how fast the same thing got over the last four decades, you'll be able to plot that sort of graph. So horizontally, it's the time, and vertically, it's a factor of performance. We can see that on average, the memory became 10 times faster. And we can see that the CPU became about 10,000 times faster. So there is a big difference, not only in what we had back then and what we have now, but also a big difference in the rate at which these two things are speeding up. And this is where the problem is. Between these two things, there is a gap, and this gap keeps on getting wider and wider, roughly 50% a year. And this gap is a problem. And so the problem becomes bigger by 50% a year. In other words, we have to focus a lot on memory, because memory is going to be the bottleneck of everything. And because this graph here has a vertical axis, which is logarithmic, it paints an interesting picture, but it might not be dramatic enough. So I just took the same numbers, and I plotted the graph again with a linear scale. And that's what you get. And so exact same numbers. Uh, but this one looks a lot more like a serious problem that we have to take into consideration. And so it started getting pretty, pretty bad around uh, 2005 for the games industry, uh, which is quite interesting because this corresponds to the release of the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. I'll get back to this a bit later. But clearly, it's something that has always been a problem, but we really need to focus on right now. So that's the first constraint we have to work with. The second constraint, well, this one is specific to Unity. We have existing workflows that we want to keep. And this point is important for all the Unity developers out there. Because um, initially, when we started talking a lot about DOTS, about ECS, and about performance by default, uh, we also said that the way that you use Unity would have to change and evolve. That's still true. But the key point is that we want this to be very progressive. And there is absolutely no plan for us to sort of reduce the effort that we put on game objects. So we'll keep on supporting game objects. We'll keep on working on those for as long as people use them. But at the same time, We'll be spending a lot of time on ECS and DOTS, trying to get these two tech to uh, ramp up together. And we'll also provide a smooth migration from one to the other. This is what we call the conversion workflow. Um, that's something that we started using when we made the Mega City, simply because this demo, so demo from last year, uh, uses a very large environment that would not be possible with a classic approach with, uh, with Unity. But we still had to use the current Unity editor. And so we just built this conversion pipeline that allows you to keep working with Unity, classic Unity that you can just get. I mean, it's a, it's a released version of Unity. And the only difference is that you have one extra step between editing your scene and having it in the player, which is this conversion. So this second constraint is specific to Unity, but very important to us. 
And this leads us to data-oriented design. So data-oriented design is something that, we, um, that we've seen the rest of the industry use for a, for a while that we applied to Unity also in some specific parts. Uh, but because of this dramatic increase of CPU performance and the huge gap between CPU and memory, we thought that just applying it to certain parts of the engine was not going to be enough. We have to use it everywhere. And so data-oriented design is actually a set of simple guidelines. And the most important one is that we need to understand the hardware. And we cannot really solve a performance problem in a vacuum. We need to solve it by considering the actual machines that our games run on. Which means pay a lot of attention to the memory bottleneck. Also, make sure that we reduce expensive um, or frequent branching. So when a CPU has to always consider everything as a special case, you keep on jumping all over the place in the code, which is not that great. I'll get back to this. We want to exploit parallelism because all modern CPUs are multi-core. And we also need to exploit asynchronicity. So you have a bunch of things, especially when it comes to loading data from the drive or from the network, a lot of things that take a lot of time to complete, and so we cannot afford to just wait for something to be ready. We have to ask for it, do something else, and then process the thing once it's ready. So talking a bit more about the memory bottleneck, here are the things we want to achieve. And I just took a very simple um, illustration um, for, for this principle. Imagine that your memory bottleneck is a conveyor belt that loads baggage into an airplane. And so you have your main memory, the storage, which is here, the baggage truck. And you have the destination, the CPU, the cache, which in this case is the airplane. And you can here admire my skills at drawing realistic scenery. So if you need someone to help with the graphics of your game, I'm open for contracts. Um, what could go wrong there? Well, first thing, what if the memory is not ready? So when you need to load something, you have your conveyor belt, which is your bottleneck, so you want to use it as much as possible. You want to keep using it all the time. And if the thing you need to load is not ready, is not there yet, well, you're just wasting that bandwidth. That's the first thing you want. Always keep running. For this, you want prefetching. So prefetching is just making sure that the CPU can anticipate what you will need so that by the time that you need it, the data is already there. What else can go wrong? Well, you might be loading stuff, but you might not be using the whole capacity of your conveyor belt. In other words, you might be loading only parts of your cache lines. And the rest of the things that you're loading in those cache lines is unused. On average, and that's a very rough average, uh, but we can see that on typical modern applications and games, approximately half of what gets loaded gets discarded because it wasn't used before the cache line got flushed. So using the full capacity for useful stuff is important. So what you want is packing all the useful stuff together. One last thing that can go wrong is if you have a mix of stuff that you're loading into your CPU. And so here, the different colors of these pieces of uh, luggage represent things that will have to be handled differently inside the plane, inside the CPU. And so this looks like you're using your bottleneck efficiently. You're loading everything you can into the CPU. And that's true. But then inside the CPU, you will actually waste a lot of time just uh, dispatching that stuff left and right. Uh, to be more precise, 
it's the uh, branch predictor that will have a hard time predicting what you're doing if the stuff that you're doing is, well, unpredictable. So what you want there, and so these two slides have exactly the same thing on the conveyor belt, but the difference is that here I'm grouping by color. So all the things that need the same processing go together, and the same for the other categories. That gives us the ideal data layout that we want for everything related to our game, or at least everything that scales. We want stuff which is linear. So linear means that everything is stored together in memory. So when you start loading something, well, it's pretty easy to figure out what you're going to load next because you're just following your, uh, well, the layout of your data in, in memory. And so the, the thing that loads your, uh, your data can anticipate what you will need next. And so it can start loading your cache in advance. So you don't have to wait for it. That's the key point. So something packed, don't waste the bandwidth. And something grouped so that the CPU can figure out uh, and anticipate what it will have to do. And so to do this, Here's the main concept, embrace data, uh, which looks a little bit um, surprising when you're coming from a pure object-oriented programming background. Because here what we say is that we should try to resist abstraction and not think about all this, the things that we have in our games as just objects that really uh, bundle the data and the behavior that would allow us to work at a higher level when we design the whole thing, but that would also lock us out of a bunch of optimizations. And so this might be the, the, the biggest takeaway, and if you look at the demos that we released, you will see this, that the data is plain and visible everywhere. And that the whole game should be considered as just a series of transformation steps through that data. So you have information in memory, you have a frame that executes a bunch of transformation steps in your data pipeline, and then you have the result at the end of the frame. And so when you start thinking about a game this way, you will make sure to lay out your data in such a way that the processing that you want to do on it, well, works well. So it's really about thinking, what do I need to do the thing I want, instead of going the other way around, which is what we tend to do, which is what am I doing, and then figure out the data as a consequence of it. So think about transformation, and just an example here is, um, I guess many of you had to implement at some point a safe system on top of a game which was not designed for it. And that's usually a very painful experience because you realize that your data is all over the place, and is not in a very nice format for serialization. And typically at this point, you think, oh, if I had designed my data to be just something which is minimal and which is well-structured and which is grouped, that would have been a lot easier to just serialize the whole thing and load it back. And also because the data tends to be grouped and accessible and visible and so on, you can also measure it and profile it frequently through the whole development. Okay, so that's, that's the goal, but now how do we do it in practice in Unity? And also, how does the rest of the industry do it? Well, this, this last point here is because uh, you shouldn't get the impression that data-oriented design is something that Unity decided to do and that we are kind of inventing something completely new here. This has been standard, Unity, uh, standard industry practice sorry, uh, for the past 15 years, roughly. So you can find a bunch of talks at various conferences and blogs and publications and so on about, well, various game companies who have been applying these principles of data-oriented design to various things. What we are trying to do here is first to apply it to everything and second to make it easy to access to all the game developers using Unity. 
So we know it works. It's kind of a safe bet. So we just now have to make it work everywhere. That leads us to the Entity Component System, ECS. So that's what Unity built to apply these principles in the context of our engine. So that's not the only way that you can apply data-oriented design, but that's the one that works best for what we're doing. And let's just try to build this from, from the start and from core principles. So I said we want something linear, something grouped, and something packed. In other words, we want arrays. And here I'm just representing the kind of data that you would want to have for a typical, let's say, a roguelike game. So you just have a, a bunch of monsters roaming around, uh, and they have a bunch of characteristics. And I just took three for my slides here. So health, position, and target. So the health is just a counter, the position is a vector, and the target is something that identifies another monster or a player character or whatever. The key with the target is that not all monsters will have a target. They are not all attacking something. This will become relevant soon. So I have three arrays. Why three arrays and not just one? I could have one array with health position target, health position target, health position target. Well, this comes from the fact that we want to only load useful stuff in the CPU every time we do any kind of transformation to this. And so maybe you have your game logic which is moving your monsters around. When this game logic executes, it doesn't care about the health. It only cares about the position and the target. So where am I and where am I going? If everything was stored interleaved, health position target, health position target, and so on, then in a way I would be also loading the health, although I don't need it. So by keeping everything in separate arrays, I can make sure that I'm only loading the things that I'm currently accessing. So that's the principle of this conveyor belt. But it turns out that in practice, you have several conveyor belts that you can use at the same time, several, several prefetching lines. So in ECS terminology, we name all these types components. So we have a health component, a position component, and a target component. And we name a group of components an entity. And what is extremely important here, it looks like a detail, but actually the whole thing is built on this. What is important is that an entity is the group of all the components which are at the same position in all the arrays. So here, this entity is the first health, the first position, the first target. This entity is the second health, second position, second target. Same for the third one. And so, in this case, my entity is a monster. But the entity itself does not contain anything. An entity is just an index, just a number that tells you where in all the arrays the data that you want and the data that belongs together is. This is where it's very different from a game object where a game object is more like a container, an entity is just an integer. Good. But you have different types of objects in your game, of course. Uh, to illustrate that point, I just took this. The fact that some monsters have a target and some monsters don't. So what might be tempting is to say, OK, everyone has a target. But in some cases, the target is just empty. So you still pay the price of storing that stuff, which might be OK, it might be small. Uh, but then you also pay the price of somehow processing that stuff, even if when you don't need it. So if you want to move all the monsters 
that have a target. And if you just load all the monsters and for each one figure out if they have a target or not and ignore the ones who don't, well, you're kind of violating two of the main principles of what we're trying to do. You would be loading useless stuff, the null targets, and you would also be branching on the monsters. Do I have a target or not? And always do different kind of processing there. So what could we do? We would like to pack all these targets together. But if we do that, then we would change the order of all the things in the other arrays, or we would have a mismatch, and our entities would not um, match each other anymore. So what do we do? Well, we just split everything in two in this case. And we just say, we don't have just one category of monsters, we have two. So we have one category that has health position and targets, and one that does not have a target. And so now we have two health arrays, two position arrays, and only one target array. In ECS terminology, that's what we call an archetype. So every time you add and remove certain components to your entities, you will eventually create archetypes, and you will have your data moving from one archetype to the other archetype. And you might say, oh, but that, that's actually moving stuff in memory. That sounds expensive. And that's right. It is expensive. But the key observation here is that you will typically spend a lot less time changing the structure of your game then you will spend time iterating over the data in your game. So here we are optimizing for the common case. What you do the most often is the most important in terms of performance. And so here, every time a player gets close enough to a monster that the monster starts attacking the player, well, the monster will move from one archetype to the other. It's moving a bit of data in memory. But then once it is in this attacking state, it will stay there for a while. All right. There's another thing annoying with this uh, native approach, which is that what if we have tens of thousands of monsters? And let's pretend that they are all attacking the player. Well, first, it means that the player is in trouble. But the second thing it is that um, in terms of storing this in memory, and if we want to change the structure of these arrays, well, it's going to be tricky because what if you want to add something in there? What if you want to remove something in there? Uh, you will have to change the size of your huge arrays. And when you change the size of an array, you frequently end up copying the whole array, which is expensive. Um, but we don't want to have holes in the middle of the, array, of the array because we want to keep everything packed. So the approach here is that we just split everything in a bunch of what we call chunks. So it's the idea of keeping the same arrays, but we see, simply cut them into smaller and easier to manage pieces. And then we store these pieces independently from each other. And so instead of having big arrays, we now have a bunch of small arrays. And when we want to reorder them, add stuff, remove stuff, we only have to deal locally with these small arrays. So the concept of chunk is something that comes over all the time when you're looking at what Unity is doing with ECS. And fundamentally, it's just this. It's a block of memory. And in our current implementation, all the chunks have the same size. This will probably change, but we're not there yet. So for now, they are all uh, 16 kilobytes of data each. Uh, it's not very important, but it gives you um, an idea of the scale. 
because they all have the same size, it also means that when you have entities or archetypes with a lot of components, you will have less entities in a chunk. And if you have less components, you have more entities in a chunk. And also, because they are all the same size, we can reuse them from archetype to archetype. And so that's what an archetype is. It's a list of chunks. Fundamentally, that's really simple. Uh, and the little uh, rainbow next to the archetype means that this archetype is the one that, sorry, that matches that set of three components. So each archetype will have its own list of chunks. Good, so that's, that's the data. But now, how do you access that data? Because everything is stored in the, these sort of uh, structures. How do you express your intents? I want to move everything that has a position and a target, for example. Well, when you look at all the archetypes that you have in your game, you'll have a, a pretty big list, typically in the hundreds or thousands. And they are, well, each archetype is a unique set of components. And, um, Let's keep saying that the, the green square, so the B component, is the position, and you want to access everything that has a position. Well, the way you would do it is by defining what we call a query, or an entity query. And so we just say, okay, the list of all the things that have a position is fundamentally a list of chunks. These chunks are stored inside archetypes, and we know that all the chunks inside one archetype all have the same component. So in the end, we only need to find the archetypes that match our query, and off we go. And here, the interesting thing is that you might say, yeah, but what am I looking for exactly by searching all my positions? Because in the context of my game, I have a bunch of things that have a position. My monsters, but my players have a position, my projectiles have a position, my NPCs have a position, and so on. So is this really useful to have everything that has a position? Well, it depends what you're doing with it. Maybe you're just building some sort of quad tree or oak tree to just have some uh, global partitioning for your raycasts, and you just need to figure out the set of everything which is in your world and you don't really care if it's a monster, if it's a chest, if it's a house or whatever. You just want everything that has any kind of presence in the world to be stored in there. And then it would be a bit weird to have one special loop for every type of object that you have in your game. That's one of the things that ECS allows you to do. You can say everything that has a position or everything that has a bounding box everything that has a mesh is going to be processed by the same system, by the same uh, piece of code. And so it's a very um, horizontal way of thinking about your code. You're not really thinking in terms of objects, but in terms of properties that these objects have. Queries can be more complex than that, but it still is a very simple language. Uh, in terms of queries, you can ask for several components at the same time. So you might say that you're interested in components B and C, and only the entities that have both of these, in which case it will only match these two archetypes. We have subtractive queries, where you can say, I'm interested in things that have this component C, but I'm not interested in the ones that have the uh, D component, the purple one. And so if I did not have that subtractive component here, it means that I would be matching the one in the middle, but because I have this subtractive here, it's not there. So I could keep on giving examples of queries. Uh, it's not really, it would not be very, very interesting. But just know that we have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of options for finding your data, for expressing precisely what you want to work with. 
uh, but it still remains a very simple way of accessing the data. And it might look a lot like a database, and it's because it is a database. It's just a simple real-time database which has been built for games. Okay, back to the idea of transformations. So back to the idea of you have data, you want to process it, process it in a series of steps, and you have a different, um, some different content in your data at the end of that. So we saw that the data is a series of archetypes. Each archetype contains chunks, and each chunk contains the components that you want to access. And so this transformation, this transformation step, which is a series of steps, we call that systems in the ECS terminology that Unity uses. So the S is for system, and ECS for entity and component. So these systems are steps of the transformation, and they run in a well-defined order. So if you have a certain order one frame, you will still have the same order on all subsequent frames. And then each system is a piece of code that will process the data. And in order to process the data, it needs to access the data. And to access the data, the systems will simply use queries. So queries are views on the data. And so it would look like this. And so the idea with this is, um, yeah, a colleague of mine told me that this actually triggers some sort of optical illusion. You might see points appearing in the white <laughs> circles. Um, so all these queries are just accessing a certain set of archetypes, the ones that match the components that your system wants to process. The system can then modify the contents of all these components, and then the next system executes. And this picture here is actually pretty important for us and for the way that the systems will, um, let's say, execute and depend on each other. Because with this, we can figure out which system needs to be done before another system can execute. So we just want to avoid race conditions. So if you have a system which is currently writing to the position, you don't want to have another system which is reading or writing to the position to run at the same time. And so I told you that the systems would execute one after each other. But internally, the systems will actually create jobs. So they will create um, threads, if you want, that will process that data. So everything will run asynchronously using all the cores of your CPU. And so it's important to know in which way these jobs depend on each other to make sure that only the jobs that work on different pieces of data can overlap and that the ones that can potentially conflict don't. And so that information that we extract from the queries is what we use to build the job dependency graph. And so not only we guarantee that we are using the CPU in the best possible way, all the cores, but we also guarantee that we don't have race conditions. And the way that we guarantee race conditions is not by detecting actual race conditions, but also by detecting potential race conditions. So if you tried um, working a bit with dots, uh, so with the entities package with Unity already, you might have noticed that sometimes you get an error that tells you that you have two jobs which are conflicting with each other. But when you look at your profiler, you can see that these two jobs are completely separate from each other. What the system is telling you is that, sure, they might not be overlapping right now, but because you don't have a dependency between the two, they might. And so you have to make this explicit because the worst thing that could happen is something that works 
most of the time and then just crashes horribly on some machine. So the way we deal with the uh, jobs is actually fairly simple as well. But as usual with data-oriented design, the simplest approach tends to be the most efficient one. And so we have a bunch of things that we want to process. In this case, the things will be chunks. That's the granularity at which we work. One chunk is a set of contiguous pieces of data. And we don't want to break that down further. Because otherwise, if we start dispatching all the little bits of data left and right, we would lose all the benefits of packing. So we have a query that found that list of chunks. And that's everything we want to process. And so if we did not have a job system, we would have everything running on the same core. Of course, we don't want that. We have plenty of cores. So I have only three on my slides, but well, modern CPUs will be at least eight. And so first, the simplest possible thing happens. When I schedule my job, I just have the job system split all my chunks over all the worker threads I have over all the cores that I have. Then the execution starts. And something might happen, which is that what if one of your chunks becomes a lot more expensive to compute, a lot more expensive to process than the others? Well, then you go from a picture that looked pretty nice to a picture that looks lopsided. So you have one core that will take a lot longer to complete than the others. And if there is something waiting for this job to be done, it will wait on the slowest of your threads, of course. So that's, that's not good. But what we do in this case is that every time a core, every time a worker thread completes, so if we reach this point, we're just done processing the chunk number 13. Once this one completes, it will look at the other job, um, sorry, at the, at the other workers and find the one which still has the largest amount of things to do. And it will simply steal work from it. So in this case, the last one will figure out that this one still has a lot to do and it will simply steal the chunks two, three, and four. It cannot steal the chunk one because we are currently processing it, but it can steal two, three, four. And we get this. We keep running a bit, and then this thread here, this worker completes, looks for something that still has stuff to do, figures out that this one has, and then it will steal part of it. So this idea of work stealing is pretty good because most of the time um, you don't have to do any work stealing because on average everything will take roughly the same time and so everything completes normally. And it's only at the end of your processing that you will have this uh, reassignment of chunks between jobs. So in practice this, good, this gives really, really good results. So, wrapping up with the, um, the, the main pillars of what we're doing and just a few words about the, the future. We have um, the data-oriented tech stack is actually a set of technologies. I've been talking today about the entity component system and a little bit about the c -sharp job system. We also have the burst compiler, which is um, something which is kind of impressive because it's uh, our own compiler. Um, based on LLVM, that takes a subset of the C-sharp language, the same subset that we use to write jobs, and it compiles it in very efficient machine code. And so you don't have to do a lot of things to get the benefits of Burst, and it just increases the runtime performance dramatically. So it's all part of the data-oriented tech stack, 
And all these components work independently from each other. You can use one, but not the others. But they are made to work well together. And then the goals that we are after with all this is first, well, scalability. That's what we wanted to do in the first place. So we focus a lot on, well, these two things. First, the split between runtime data and authoring data. So when you're in the editor, when you're designing your game, when you're building your game, you want something very flexible. You also want something which is easy to interact with uh, for your game designers and programmers. You also want something which works well with source control and so on. So it has different constraints than the runtime. At the runtime, you want something which is as fast as possible, as efficient as possible. And so we have this transition from one representation to the other. That's the conversion workflow. Um, and then I will have to refer you to the, the documentation, the samples, and the, the talks that we gave um, at Unite about conversion for more details about this. But this thing will stay forever. So not only we use it for going from game object to entities, but we'll also use it later when we have eventually entities everywhere. We'll always have an authoring representation and runtime representation. We also want everything to use streaming. So if you start the mega city, for example, you will see all the buildings loaded one after each other because we want something which is reactive so that it becomes interactive immediately and then all the data shows up. So designed for streaming in the editor and at runtime. We also want something open and flexible. The whole source code for the entities package is available. And when you install the package, what you get is actually C-sharp source code that gets compiled on your own machine. So you can read it, debug it, modify it for testing, and so on. And everything is also built on packages. So you add and remove the things you want and the things you don't want. So Unity will not be this monolithic engine anymore. You will just be able to customize what you exactly want to have in there. And finally, we focus on iteration speed. Um, if you've been using dots recently, you have noticed that you have a lot of code to type and a lot of things that could be automated because the, the part where you really express your intent is, well, much smaller. So we're working a lot on reducing boilerplate with code generation. So you only write the parts which are important for your game and the rest just comes up automatically. And the last one, which is really important for us in terms of iteration speed, is live link. You basically don't have to enter and leave play mode all the time anymore. You don't have to deploy to your console or development kit anymore. You just have the game running and the editor running at the same time. And what you do in the editor automatically changes in the game. And the goal is to not have a start and stop button anymore, but to have a restart button. So just reinitialize the state of the game but you don't really load and unload everything anymore all the time. And so for more information, I would point you to the Mega City, uh, which is the, the big demo we released a year ago. We have another demo that we showed uh, a few months ago at Unite that will become public really, really soon before the end of the year, uh, but we don't have a landing page for it yet. So for now, you can go to unity.com slash megacity to download this one, play around with it. And that's it for me. So you have more information uh, at the landing page dots. And if you want to reach me by email, feel free to do so. And I will also be at the, the Unity booth just outside the door here. So if you have any question, please.